the uh, choir at Riverside Church, how would that, how was that different? Uh, the Riverside Choir was largely, uh, well, I can't say it was largely a professional choir, but there were practically everybody in that choir, everybody in that choir did read music. And um, they had to cover so much music each week that they, that they had to read music, particularly in the early days when we, when we uh, did three anthems on Sunday morning and sang an oratorio every Sunday afternoon. Uh, it was necessary that a lot of music be read. Well, you were asking about um, things that uh, I had enjoyed doing or, or would be proud of. Here again, I, I can't say I'm, I'm uh, particularly proud of it, but one of the things that I have become probably most noted for are taking uh, piano scores and orchestral scores and adapting them uh, to, to the organ. Uh, there's a real art in this, and I, I don't know how much of it can be taught. It can up to a degree, but uh, whenever I do a workshop on the topic, I always say that, that this really is dependent upon how good a faker you are because it, there is so much faking involved. You can take a, a piano score, and when you pick it up, you have to remember that it's only one person's idea of how an orchestral score reduces down to the keyboard. I've done so much of this and probably have uh, become as well known for that as anything. And this got started because at Riverside, uh, we did an oratorio every Sunday afternoon, as I mentioned, from October through, through May for many, many years. Uh, this happened actually in, in several churches in New York in the days when uh, Carnegie Hall was the only concert hall and even it didn't have uh, concerts on Sunday afternoon. So that I had to, week after week after week, take every oratorio known and unknown and boil it down to play it on the organ. Of course, I had a marvelous instrument with all the orchestral colors and the solo stops. And it was, it was just, it was like solving a wonderful uh, jigsaw puzzle every week to put the things together. And I was, I was so dumb when I was young, I didn't realize how hard it was. I just thought it was fun. <laughs> but by doing it, uh, hundreds and hundreds of them, literally, uh, it became something that I, I uh, gained a certain amount of recognition for. In September 2000, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln hosted its 22nd annual organ conference. The topic was the American Symphonic Organ, and Fred Swan was one of the four featured presenters. His first lecture, Meeting the Challenges of Accompanying at the Organ, was recorded there for this American Guild of Organists video. The organ used in Lincoln was the 1997 Schoenstein organ at First Plymouth Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. As an accompanist at the organ, I think it's the same as accompanying any, anywhere else, regardless of what instrument you're using. Uh, you're a partner with, with the choir or with another soloist, and you know when to be subservient, and you must also know when to assert yourself. I've heard some people, for instance, play an accompaniment, and beautifully when the soloist was singing and then an interlude would come along and they would still shrink back like a violet, whereas at that point is a time to come forward. And I think this is one thing to keep in mind. Remember to be assertive at certain times when you need to be. And remember that you are unique just like the, the other person. But there's certain, uh, certain basics, of course, the sensitivity, whether you're accompanying a choir or a singer, or another instrument for, the ma for that matter, to give plenty of support, to have a certain sense of intuition, to sense when you need to give a little more or a little less. Uh, you've all heard examples of people who accompany where it's almost like one person between a soloist and a choir or the accompanist, and I think this is the ideal of, of what we, uh, we should look toward. There are, of course, um, there's no substitute for experience in this sort of thing. Somebody has said that experience is something you don't get until just after you need it. And uh, so uh, people often say, well, how do you do it? Uh, I don't know how to do that. Well, it, it comes from, from experience. I dread to think what some of my first accompanying was like. I began as a church organist at age 10 and I can't imagine what my accomplishments must have sounded like at that point.
I think I probably played hymns all right then because I had a certain routine. Every Saturday afternoon, I went to see the horse opera at the local movie house. Most of you are, are too young to remember horse operas. That was the shoot 'em up westerns that were always shown at the, uh, the movie house on Saturday afternoon, so I would see that. And then I would go to the church and shoot up the hymns for Sunday morning to try to get them ready. And uh, even after 60 years of doing it, I still practice my hymns each week because I, I think that's important. And certainly it takes a lot of time for preparation with the accompaniments also. How good a faker are you? Because I think that this is absolutely essential. One thing you have to remember is that when you pick up a score, whether it's a Messiah or an Elijah or no matter what vocal score you pick up, or an anthem for that matter, if it's a reduction of an orchestral score, it's one person's idea of what that reduces down to, to the keyboard. And sometimes they're absolutely unplayable as they are. I defy even a concert pianist to take the Verdi Requiem piano score and play every note that's in that score exactly as it is. It really can't be done. So even then, you have to, uh, to uh, fake. But it's, it, even the Verdi is easier, I think, on the organ, certainly, than the piano. But it, if you're good, depend on, depending on how good a faker you are, the better your results are going to be. It sounds dishonest, but, but it really isn't. Because there's so many times when you have to change things radically. And as I said, remember that that score is only one person's idea of what, what the orchestral reduction reduces to uh, for, for a keyboard. You naturally want to preserve the notes and the rhythms that are there, hopefully, but uh, don't be afraid to move things around. Well, let's take the list. Play in the center of the keyboard. Avoid extreme chords. This, again, is very obvious. Piano scores have us going all over the keyboard like this, and what, what they're trying to do, of course, is get the wide range of orchestral instruments, or more brilliance, or, or less brilliance, as the case may be. But on the organ, we don't have to do that, because we have all these magic things, and some of those up across the front help us a lot, too. So generally speaking, I think we don't have to play all over the keyboard. Reduce things into the center of the keyboard. Number two, leave out unnecessary doubling of octaves. Most organists do not practice the piano enough as it is, and therefore their octave playing is not always as good as it should be. Well, fortunately, it's not necessary. Uh, but in addition to leaving them out, there are, there, you will discover a few places where it's quite uh, in order to play the octaves. But be alert to places where octaves are rather a doubling of sound uh, of, the, of the notes or the chords will enhance the sound, or where it's actually called for in the orchestral score. Uh, take, for instance, one that uh, has always been a pet peeve with me is the pastoral symphony from, from the Messiah of Handel. Now, you're holding the Novello edition, the Watkin Shaw edition, which is very good. Uh, if you look, for instance, look at the pastoral symphony, which is on page... Um, 65. Now this is as it should be, but most of us grew up, and many of us still play from, from time to time, the Shermer score. And the Shermer score has only a low C, what would be low C on the organ keyboard, and a right hand part. And I hate to tell you, that the number of times I have been to Messiah performance and heard an organist actually play that way, where they would pull out a 16-foot stop in the pedal, sometimes not even an 8-foot stop, and plant their foot on low C, and then, oh, well, this is pretty, I'll use the strings. So they pull out the strings, and then they would play. That's exactly what they saw on the page, but that has no connection with what's actually intended in the orchestral score. As this one shows, it should be played doubly. Similarly, I would bring the low C of the pedal up to the middle C of the pedal, put on the manual decoupler pedal, and since it's a little awkward at times to 
to uh, exactly duplicate in both hands what should happen, uh, use the subcoupler if you have it. Which is quite different from arpeggios. We all run into these from time to time, probably the most famous one being what? The Lord's Prayer <laughs> of Malat. Fortunately, Carl Weinrich did a very good organ reduction of that score years ago. But generally speaking, if, if there are arpeggios all over the place, uh, sometimes it can be very effective depending on, uh, on how the music is written or what's going on with the text. But there are other times when the arpeggio goes a little bit too far afield and you might want to hold the cushioning chord on one manual. Cushioning chords can be very helpful and then reduce the arpeggio into uh, the center of the keyboard or, or within an area that you can comfortably do it with one hand. Triplet figures. Do not repeat every note unless the tempo, text, organ, action make it viable. Again, you might want to sustain a chord on a second manual with one hand or hold certain notes in, in the chord while repeating others. Now, there are times when you want to sound like uh, the Lone Ranger coming down the road, and you, you will want to repeat everything under the sun. But in some organs, that will sound like it's just an organ with a very, very bad tremulant. So here again, listen to what you're doing. Um, sometimes uh, repeat certain notes. If one doesn't give you the desired effect, repeat two. holding in the left hand uh, a, a cushioning cord that will take away from the, from the bad uh, tremolo effect. Now, actually, I think, too, there, there are a couple, couple ways of doing the tremolo. One is to do it just like you would on the, uh, on the piano by moving, by moving the notes in the hand. Uh, another one would be, if it's in the pedal, if you have a good 32, sometimes that will give you the effect of, of something rolling around. Otherwise, don't hesitate, and I'll demonstrate this in this in just a moment, to, uh, to play the pedal in octaves. Uh, I don't mean uh, concurrently, but... Now, in this Watkins Shaw edition, this is the best one for many people uh, to attempt to play from when they're, when they're playing on the organ. But here, he has cut out a lot of what's going on in the orchestra. If you look at uh, letter D on page 22 at the Prestissimo, uh, he's reduced that to where it would sound actually pretty good. But in the orchestra, everything is tremoloing. Left, uh, all the low, low instruments, the high instruments. So you could do this, just what he has. And so on and so forth. What you don't want to do is exactly what Handel wrote, but it takes away from the excitement that he's trying to get in the text at that point. So the first thing I would do is to tremolo in both hands. Occasionally, you can stop one hand and, and outline the chord in block chords like this. Keep the left hand tremoloing, put the put chords in the right hand. I'll put all this together for you in a minute. And then in the pedal to, uh, to get the effect. So that if you do that, it can come out.
so on and so forth. To me, that makes it a, a great, uh, not only more exciting, but it fits what's going on musically and more of what uh, uh, Handel had in mind. Um, the same type of thing, um, well, there are many, many places. Why do the nations rage in that? If you'll take Elijah for a minute and look at uh, page 85, this is a real showpiece for bass, and they're really going to have a good time rollicking through it, and you should rollick through it with them. And when they get to the end and have a high F and end it, don't just stay on the same combination that you've had, but really bring the organ up uh, quite a bit at that point. So maybe about three lines from the end. Uh, This is one case where you're going to need a crescendo pedal. I know they are an anathema to a lot of people, but there are plenty of times when you will need a crescendo pedal, and this is one of them. The third score again. Don't hesitate to really let it out, and then... You notice there, instead of trying to play the tremlet, simply do a trill. Be aggressive at times like that. 